Hey, welcome to our lesson on atomic structure. So in the past couple of weeks, um, we've been learning about the nature of matter. Um, we learned that the early chemists and the alchemists broke down the materials around them, simplified them to get to the true nature of, of the, all of the things that are around us, all of the matter that surrounds us. And they've determined that all of the matter can be, can be brought down, can be simplified down, broken down into 92 basic components. And these are called the elements. The elements are listed, of course, on your periodic table of the elements, the 92 naturally occurring elements, and then some newer ones, some man-made elements that were added to the list, which is right now currently at 118. The question that we have today is, what makes each atom different from the atoms of another element? So what is it that makes an atom of aluminum different than an atom of oxygen, for example? So the nature or the, the, the difference in the atom comes from the internal structure of the atom itself. Whereas the early chemists believed that an atom was an indivisible piece of matter, now we know that the atom can actually be broken down there's smaller inside an atom, the subatomic particles, and that's what we're going to discuss. So these subatomic particles, there are three inside an atom, three different kinds. Um, as we scroll to your notes, these are the three subatomic particles. The protons, the neutrons, and the electrons. You've learned that Thomson discovered the electrons, and then the next discovery was made by Rutherford, who discovered the nucleus. And the nucleus contains the, the protons, subatomic particle of proton, inside the nucleus. Now, the size of the nucleus is very, very small compared to the size of an atom. Alpha particles through Rutherford's in Rutherford's experiments went right through the atom, and most of them completely unobstructed. Some of them were deflected, and some of them bounced back, as you saw in the video. The nucleus, then it became known, um, as a positive area. And furthermore, scientists discovered that most of the mass of an atom was inside the nucleus, which is what the work of Chadwick led to was the discovery of the neutron, because back then we couldn't account for all of the mass of an atom simply by looking at the electrons and the protons. The electrons essentially have practically no mass. Their mass is so small that it's negligible compared to the mass of an atom. Now, what, it's not that they have no mass at all. It's just that it's very, very, very small and therefore doesn't really factor in, much like if you stepped on the scale, but then removed the paperclip out of your pocket, your mass wouldn't change. The paperclip does weigh something, but compared to your weight, is very, very, very small. So whether the paperclip is in your pocket or you take it out, your weight is not gonna change. So an electron can be looked at or viewed the same way. It does weigh something, but it's not enough to make any difference. So then we have the protons and the, neut the neutrons, and so both of these particles are inside the nucleus. The electrons are on the outside, on the periphery. They occupy most of the space.
The electrons seem, as far as we know today, to be an elementary part, um, an elementary particle, meaning that there is no other, no indication of, of there be anything inside there besides energy itself. So an electron doesn't appear to be made up of smaller things, but the neutrons and the protons are made up of smaller yet particles, the quarks. And there are three quarks in the proton and there's also three quarks in the neutron. So the proton is gonna have two up quarks and a down quark, whereas the neutron will have two down quarks and an up quark. When we look at atoms, then since they're all made of the same three particles, what makes an atom different than another atom is the number of these particles that they have. And most importantly, the one particle that makes all the difference is the proton. So when you look at a periodic table, either, whether it's on paper or it's on an app on your phone, you look, if you look at the periodic table, really only one number seems to be listed right here. And that number is the atomic number. If we look at fluorine, for example, on the periodic table, either on your app or on paper, fluorine is atomic number nine. And when you pull it up, you'll probably see a mass of 19. Now the mass of an element can change, and that's an isotope. So isotopes are elements or atoms of an element, the same element, that have a different weight. For example, if you had a fluorine that weighed 19 and another fluorine that weighed 20, those would be fluorine isotopes. They're both fluorine, but they have a different weight. What's important to remember is that no matter what their weight is, if it's fluorine, it's number nine always. Each element on the periodic table has its own specific unchanging atomic number. Fluorine is number nine, always. This atomic number represents the number of protons. Fluorine is number nine because it has nine protons. And that's the, the characteristic of fluorine, and that's how you recognize an atom as being an atom of, of the element fluorine, is because it has nine protons. A mass of 19. So in this case, remember that electrons essentially have no weight. So if electrons don't really weigh anything, this number 19 then has to be from protons and neutrons. And we already know that the number of protons is nine. So 19, the weight of this atom is nine plus the number of neutrons. So the number of neutrons would be 10. So the atomic number of an element always tells you the protons, and the weight always tells you the sum of protons and neutrons. So if you take the weight and you subtract the atomic number, you'll get the number of neutrons. The number of electrons then, the last subatomic particle, well, since we're talking about atoms, and by definition, an atom is a neutral particle. If it's neutral, it means that the number of positive charges has to be the same as the number of negative charges. In subatomic particles, the proton is positive one, proton 
positive. The neutron is neutral. The electron is a negative charged particle. So the number of electron in an atom has to be the same as the number of protons. Protons are positive, electrons are negative, and they must equal out to zero. They must cancel each other out so that the charge on the atom is zero. So in this case, the fluorine atom with nine protons, therefore, there's also nine electrons. And that's how we figure out the number of subatomic particles for every element, every atom of every element on the periodic table. As you, speaking of the periodic table, as you look at the elements on the periodic table, you find that, um, well, first of all, some of the names are a little bit strange, it would seem, like iron with the symbol Fe, uh, or gold with the symbol Au. This is because some of the elements on the periodic table have their symbols derived from their Latin name. So for gold, the Latin name is aurum, and now we can see why gold would have symbol AU. It makes sense. Iron is ferrum. Again, now we understand why Fe makes sense. Some elements also have um, two letters to represent, um, whereas other elements have only one. For all elements that have two letters, the first letter is always a capital letter, and the second letter is always lowercase. This is important to avoid some confusion between CO, cobalt, capital C, small o, lowercase o, compared to carbon monoxide, capital C, capital O. The O is capital letter, which tells you that it's a separate element. So the first letter of an element is always capital, and the second letter, if there is one, is lowercase. So then, the most important characteristic of an element in terms of subatomic particle is the number of protons. And that's where we get the identity of an atom from. In your notes, we have the following example, which is for carbon. A carbon atom has a number six and a mass of 12. So because carbon is number six, that tells you that it has six protons. The atomic number of the element is always the number of protons. Again, that is unchanging. The mass of this element, the mass is 12. Now that is variable. In the case of carbon, most carbons are 12, but some could be 13 and some could be 14 as well. In this particular example, the mass is 12. And so therefore, 12 is the number of protons plus the number of electrons, uh, the number of neutrons, sorry. So again, 12 is the number of protons, six, plus the number of neutrons, which would have to be six as well. So this particular atom of carbon would have six neutrons. And because it has six protons, and each proton is a positive charge, it would also have six electrons. Let's look at a different example. Fluorine. Fluorine is number nine on the periodic table because it is atomic number nine. We know that it has nine protons. So atomic number nine. The mass of the element is 19. So 
in this example, fluorine has an atomic weight of 19, which means that 19 is equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. We know that the protons are nine from the atomic number nine. So nine plus neutrons is equal to 19 and therefore 10 neutrons. Here's another example, sodium. Let's pause the video and you figure out the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons for sodium. Now, sodium has atomic number 11. The atomic number is always the number of protons. Now, some periodic table have the atomic number at the bottom, some periodic table have the periodic, the atomic number on top. It doesn't matter. You can always tell which one is which because the atomic number is always gonna be the smaller of the two. Remember, the mass is a number of protons plus neutrons. So the mass can't be lower than the atomic number. So the atomic number is number 11, which tells us that it has 11 protons. The mass number is 23. And so the number of protons we found to be 11. So 11 plus the neutrons is equal to 23, which gives us 12 neutrons. Since we're talking about an atom, which must be neutral, positive and the negative charges must be equal. 11 protons, therefore 11 electrons. Let's look at an example finally where we have to fill in the blanks So grab your periodic table and pause the video and take some time to uh, do silicon, SI. All right, all done. Silicon on your, tab on your uh, table is number 14. This is the atomic number for silicon. We are given the information here that the mass is 28. Again, the mass is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Also, we know that the atomic number is the same as the number of protons, which tells us that the protons is 14. The number of neutrons, therefore, being that the mass comes from the number of protons plus neutrons, we have 28, which is equal to 14 plus 14. 14 neutrons plus 14 protons gives us number 28. Lastly, the number of electrons must be the same as the number of protons because this is an atom. And so therefore the number of electrons in this case would be 14. On the next line, number two, you can pause before I do it right now. We don't know what symbol this is, and to find out, we need to look at the atomic number because that's the only thing that cannot change. In this example, the atomic number is six. And so if the atomic number is six, 
it tells us that the number of protons is six. Remember, the protons and the atomic number are always the same. For an atomic number six on the periodic table is carbon. The mass of this particular atom of carbon is protons, six, plus neutrons, eight. This is a mass of 14. We're going to come back to that in the next session. In the next session, carbon is, like we said, generally 12, but there are atoms of carbon that weigh 14, like there are atoms of carbon that weigh 13. Those are isotopes. The important thing to remember is that they all have six protons because they're carbon. I hope this helps and that maybe helps you understand um, how we can determine the number of subatomic particles in an atom. Have a wonderful day and thank you for watching.